roughly 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 it, 10 years roughly ago, 10 yeah. years ago mainly because you wanted your daughters not only to speak mandarin but to understand asia to be part of asia yes what balance do you make of that decision 10 years later well, uh, it worked. They it worked. both of my daughters speak uh, fluent. They speak native Mandarin now. Uh, they, in fact, they win Mandarin speaking contest mm. in Singapore, which is a shock. Makes me very proud. Yeah, but, I it, guess. but it's a shock. Uh, so that part has worked very well, and they certainly know a lot more about Asia than I did mm. when I was their age. Probably more than I know now. So it, that part has been very, very successful. Right. When did you come to the conclusion that China was going to be the most successful country of the 21st century? Well, probably in the 80s, but certainly by the 90s, I yeah. knew that. I so first came to China in uh, 1984. Right. I was scared because I'd been listening to American propaganda all my life that the Chinese were evil and vicious and bloodthirsty people. I got here and I found out they're not evil and bloodthirsty and terrible people. <laughs> they're ambitious and yeah. they're educated and, and they discipline their children. Right. They, I said they have a great future. Right. So I came to realize... Well, probably certainly by the late 80s and 90s that it was the place to be was China. Mm -hmm. I would back to America. I would lecture. I would broadcast. I would write that everybody should teach their children Mandarin because it would be the language of the 21st century. Then I had one. <laughs> so I had to do something. What do I do now? Yeah. So I had my own daughter in 2003. We got a, a Chinese n n a governess to come and live with us. And I said, you never speak uh, English. You only speak Mandarin to the little girl. And then we realized we had to move to, if I was serious, we had to move to Asia. Yeah. So here we are. And so you did. Uh, s 10 years ago, when you wrote A Bull in China, roughly also 10 years ago, you were of the opinion of shortening the US dollar and going long on commodities. Yep. What is your take on those two things for, in to for 2017? Well, at the moment, I own a lot of U.S. dollars. Yeah. Uh, as you probably know, the U.S. Yeah. dollar did go down for a while. But over the last two or three years, I've been very bullish on the U.S. dollar. And so I own a lot of U.S. dollars at the moment. I still own commodities. Uh, in fact, I would probably be buying more commodities now. Uh, I'm not buying gold. But otherwise, most commodities are making the, the bottom during mm. this uh, re consolidation. Yeah. So it's probably a time to be long commodities and U.S. dollars. Hmm, both. Why do you write books? I wonder because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you could get a better ROI on your time doing something else. Why books? Uh, I wonder myself. Uh, yeah. That first book, I came back from going around the world on my motorcycle. I happened to be at a dinner and the guy said, well, where have you been? I haven't seen you in a while. And I said, I've just come back from going around the world on a motorcycle. He said, I want the story. <laughs> he was the head of a major magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, he was at the same dinner I was. Uh, so we wrote this, th we did this a, a long interview. The publisher saw it and said, why don't you do a book? So I said, okay, why not? And then that's how the first book happened by accident. Then the second book, more or less the same way. I went around the world again and came back and they said, hey, let's do a follow-up. And then you took the liking. <laughs> well, I, it just sort of grew. Uh, then yeah. I, they were both successful books. Then uh, my publisher called me and said, you know, you're always talking about commodities. There are no books on commodities. And when he said that, I said, aha. So then I said, okay, we'll do a book about commodities. So, so, so one book led to another, and who knows? Yeah. I've done six books. I never thought I'd do any books. <laughs> are you working on something right now? No, Is no, something no. Coming well, up? I might. Someone just recently said to me, why don't you update how you see the world? And I said, maybe. Maybe. Uh, so uh, I'm not, but, but maybe. Uh -huh. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the Federal Reserve of the United States is not a government institution. It's a roughly private entity. Uh, technically, you're right, yes. Right. That is in the business of inventing money out of thin air that sells to the U.S. government in exchange of debt that Americans and the rest of the world buy. That's roughly correct. It is. Roughly correct, roughly. yes. Who loses here? Because this is the best business model ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I lose. <laughs> right? Everybody watching this How? lose. Because, you know, but now central banks all over the world are in the business of printing money. They're already pulling money out of the air. Uh, the, the Japanese have said, we will print unlimited, that's their word, unlimited amounts of money. The, the, the Europeans said, well, we will do whatever it takes. That's right. their word. So the British said, well, we got to do this too. Everybody 
Everybody's doing it now. And so this is not good for you or me. This has never happened in recorded history. This is not what central banks were set up to do over the decades. Uh, in my view, these, this will fail uh, one way or the other. America's had three central banks, first two disappeared for various reasons. Mm. In my view, this one will disappear too. Mm. Now, a world without central banks has problems, but a world with these central banks is going to have worse problems right. before it's over. You have a very solid track record warning about major corrections in the markets. You were right about the uh, stock market collapse of the uh, of '87. You were right about real estate correction 2008, 2007. You were right about uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. <laughs> now you're very vocal about another major correction in the markets coming up. Uh, why do you do this? Because I mean, being a Cassandra is not fun. Uh, well, people ignore you, ridicule you. Uh, wh why do you? Th why bother? That's for sure. Uh, but listen, I make plenty of mistakes. Don't think right. I don't. Let me tell you about. Yeah, my, well, I'll tell you about my we first forget, wife. We forget about those. About my first <laughs> wife, huh? I'd like to forget about her. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I ran into her recently, quite by accident. Yeah. I am so glad I am not married to her anymore. <laughs> that was such. At the time, I was upset. Right. You know, and I looked at her. And I said, what if I have still married you? I didn't say this out okay. loud. I, I said it to myself. <laughs> right. What if I had spent all these years married you? What a horrible, horrible mistake. That <laughs> and I'm sure many people, many people watching this would say the same thing about their first spouse. They would say, oh, what a mistake. So I make plenty of mistakes. Right. I don't know why I do it. People ask me. Uh, I used to have a job. I, I, I liked it when people would help me when I needed help. So when people call me and ask me, why not? You just tell them. Giving up the U.S. citizenship has become something of a trend. So here my question is double. It's a twofold question. Have you ever thought about it yourself? And why is this happening? Well, of course, I've thought about it. Everybody in, in 2017 thinks about it because you see what's happening to the world, especially every American who lives abroad thinks about it because right. there are many of us who don't ever go back. Now, I go back a lot, but many never go back and don't earn any money and still they have to pay American taxes no matter mm -hmm. where they live. Uh, one reason it's, it's happening that people are giving it up now is for certainly the tax reasons, if you never go back, I met a guy in Hong Kong who has 150 countries, companies, Company. 150 companies, and he said, his accountant said to him, look, if you make a mistake, or if we make a mistake, you are going to pay a very heavy price because the penalties are terrible for yeah. people living abroad. So they said, you really have to give up your citizenship just because if something goes wrong, you could lose everything. Uh, just by a simple mistake, right. honest mistake. Right. So he had to give up his citizenship uh, because the laws are so draconian and the penalties are so great. So everybody living abroad thinks about it. I think about it. Yeah, of course I have. I'm still an American. All, my whole family, we're all still Americans. But we think about it. And the reason that it's people are doing it is because, A, the tax reasons, the complications. B, it's not a good passport because if you're on a plane and the terrorist says, give us your passports, you don't want to have an American right. passport. Right. That you want to have a, a Spanish passport. Right. You want to have Canadian anything. or something. Yeah, right? you want to have right. anything, but a, but a Hong Kong, anything but an American passport. When they start collecting passports, so there are many reasons that people are doing it. Uh, some people have virtually never been to the U.S. Uh, and yet they have to pay American taxes. So of course they don't have any. Even even though they have nothing to do with the U.S., they still are liable for U.S. taxes. Right. What is your take on the euro and the European Union for the next decade or so? Well, I don't expect the euro to survive as it is now. I doubt if the European Union will survive as it is now. It's unfortunate. We, the world needs something to compete with the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is a very flawed currency. Now, I own a, I own a lot of U.S. dollars, mm. so be sure you understand. But it's a very flawed currency. America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, and the debts are going higher and higher every day. So the world needs something to compete with the U.S. dollar. The euro would be perfect. Big market, big economy, uh, balance of trade, surplus. But unfortunately, the euro is badly executed. Yeah, they haven't done a good job of, of s doing what they, they said they were going to do. And there's really nothing else at the moment to compete with the U.S. dollar. Right. The renminbi 
I mean, the renminbi is a blocked currency. So it's absurd to talk about it competing with the U.S. dollar, at least for several years. So we need something, and it's, but it's unfortunate that the euro has been badly conceived. There are many people, you know, when Brexit occurred and was successful, it has encouraged many people in Europe and many people in Europe who want to split from their own country, Spain, Italy, many places, and many people who want to split from the EU. Uh, so they're all encouraged now. Right. You're going to see more people saying, let's, let's leave my country, let's leave the euro. So you're going to see a lot more uh, turmoil in the next few years from other people who are going to say, let's do it too. Just as a thought exercise, if you were forced, for whatever reason, to put all of your money in one of the following countries for the next five years, uh, which one would you choose? Iran, Nigeria, or Kazakhstan? <laughs> Iran, <laughs> Nigeria. Nigeria, or Kazakhstan. Well, my first reaction is Iran, but <coughs> that would be difficult for <coughs> It would be difficult for me because I'm an American. Uh, right. So I guess I would have to say Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Tell me about Russia. You had been very pessimistic about um, Russia as an investment destination for decades, but now you're rather bullish. Why is that? What has changed? I first went to Russia in 1966, and the whole uh, iron, coal, what was it called? Uh, the Iron Curtain, behind the Iron right. Curtain in those days. And I came away pessimistic. I said, this is never going to work. And so for the next several decades, 47, 48 years, I was pessimistic. I didn't see how it possibly could work. But something has happened in the Kremlin now. Uh, the attitude has changed. They used to just shoot you or put you in jail or take your money if they didn't like you. That has changed. I, I'm not quite sure why or what. So, and there are vast resources, vast resources in Russia. So if you have the right attitude, it's not a big debtor nation like Spain or America or other places. It's got a balance of trade surplus I in most years. So it, it could be a spectacular investment destination if they have the right attitude. Mm. And from what I can see, they do have the, the attitude has changed in the Kremlin. So now, it's a, and it's hated. I love markets that are hated. Mm. You know, if I can find some reason that where something is changing in a hated market, I'd love to invest there. It's certainly been a hated market. Now, that's beginning to change, uh, and so it's starting to go up a lot, but it's still not a popular market. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, what, what, what is it necessary to excel in this, investing, uh, in this investing thing? What separates an excellent investor from a just very good investor? Well... <sighs> I, I'm not sure if I knew I would be rich, <laughs> uh, you know, but it, you have to be uh, skeptical. You have to be curious. You have to be go willing to uh, go against the accepted wisdom. I'm trying to teach my daughters to be uh, to think independently, which is very hard to do. So you're trying to teach them not to follow the crowd. I'm trying to teach them to be very curious that when you hear something, don't accept it. Say, now, wait, what's really going on here? And, and I'm also trying to teach them to beware of boys, you know, because <laughs> I, I know they need to beware of boys as they grow up. Right. But no, you have to think independently and be skeptical of everything you hear. And the term contrarian, it means, you know, you don't listen to what other people, you do the opposite of what, that's not, it, it can be a, a good way description, but you don't do the opposite of what people do just to do the opposite. There has to be a reason to do the opposite of what right. the other people do. But the, if you're curious and independently and you can figure out what's really happening, you might be successful. Other than keeping up with what's going on in the world and taking care of your family, do you have other interests that people might not know about? <laughs> well, uh, for many years I, I had a huge uh, interest in adventure. Right. Uh, when, I, when I retired at an early age, what I hoped to do was to have adventure. That was my main goal in life at that time. Uh, I have done a fair amount of adventure, as you may know, uh, and so I've satisfied some of that. I mean, I, I don't need to jump on a motorcycle and go around the world anymore. I, I, I've done that, uh, but I still like adventure. I still want to do unusual and new things. But my main interest now, these two children, for all of my life, I was against children. 
I was adamant that I was <laughs> never going to do anything so foolish as to have a child. Children were a horrible waste of time, energy, money. I could not conceive of ruining my life by having children. I felt sorry for all those poor people who had children. Well, I want you to know, Jesus, I was totally wrong. I was 100% wrong about children. I finally had a little girl, and it was magnificent. And now I have two, and it's wonderful. <laughs> and by the way, most people, certainly in Asia, and most people in the world think that boys are better than girls. Totally wrong. <laughs> girls are so much better than boys. Right. I told my wife, if she brings home a boy, I'm going to send you both back. <laughs> so be sure you bring home a girl. And fortunately, both times she brought home mm. a girl. You went to Yale, and yes. then you studied philosophy and history in Oxford, correct? Sort of. Well, I studied, uh, my major at Yale was history. My major, at my course at Oxford was philosophy, politics, Polit and economics. Right. What book books or thinkers, philosophers, did most positively impacted you when you were a young man? Uh, well, I want to say that philosophy, when I was at Oxford studying philosophy, I was not very good at it. I couldn't quite figure it all out until later. And then I said, ah, oh, now I see what they meant. Now I understand. <laughs> and I guess I, I cannot name a specific one, but what I do remember is Aha, you have to think differently. You have to be able to think differently from what you've been thinking, uh, no matter how absurd it, it sounds, right. especially if it sounds absurd. And it did sound absurd to me when I was at Oxford mm -hmm. studying philosophy, and my, my professor certainly knew uh, I was not terribly good at it. Uh, but the philosophy, when I, go to, when I speak at universities, I tell them, they say, what should we study? We want to be rich. And I say, you need to study history and philosophy. They say, no, no, we want to be rich. Shouldn't we study finance or marketing? Or I say, no, no. History will teach you that the world is always changing and that if you want to be rich, you need to understand that everything you think today is not going to be true mm -hmm. 10 years from now, 15 years from now. You pick any year in history, 1900. Everything that people knew in 1900 was totally false in 1915, 1930. Everything that people knew in 1930 was totally false in 1945. So whatever you think is correct right now, you got to understand that in 2032, it's going to be totally wrong. And you've got to think that way and understand that about uh, life and the world. And the philosophy, learning how to think, will help you figure that out, what's right. going to happen now. Listen, I make plenty of mistakes, but if you can think independently and figure out what's going to change, look out the window. Everything is wrong. It's going to change in 15 years. So you got to look, uh, look out the window and figure out, well, right. how's it going to change? You got to think around the corners and philosophy might help you think that way. What would you say it's been your biggest failure in life? It could be My finance. first wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you already <laughs> told me that. Then. <laughs> uh, what is the best decision not to do something that you've ever taken in your life? Well, uh, as I look back on my life, you know, I went to China first in 1984, and I, I drove across China on a motorcycle in 88, 80, 86, 88, 90, what I, and I saw what was happening. Now, if I'd really been smart, I would have stayed in China. Yeah. I didn't. I wrote, I broadcast, I lectured. This is the, the future. I went back to New York. Right. If I'd been smart, I would have. That's the second biggest mistake. My first <laughs> wife was the first. The second biggest mistake, I right. didn't stay in China in the 80s. And I knew. I knew what was happening. Right. And yet I didn't do anything about it. So, Mr. Royce, I want to be respectful of your time. The very last question. In the book, A Gift to My Daughters, you tell them to never follow the crowd, as we just said, <laughs> and question everything. What other lesson that you learned later in your life would you like them to learn as soon as possible in theirs? Well, a slight correction. It's a gift to my children. I to my I'm sorry. To be I'm sorry. Yeah, they happen I'm to sorry. be daughters. Right. But, but just a slight correction. Uh, well, I, I told you, beware of boys. Mm. You've got to beware of boys. Uh, I don't want them. I meet so many females who f I say, why are you living in Sydney? Well, my boyfriend moved <laughs> to Sydney. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I t try to tell my girls, 
Do not follow some guy. You make him follow you. You don't live your life for someone else. You live your life for yourself. And you've got to be strong enough and independent and courageous enough to do, and knowledgeable enough to do that. And you say to the boy, I'm going to Sydney. If you want to come, okay. <laughs> or I'm going to Berlin. Wherever you're going to go, right. do it. Uh, so that is one of the major lessons I'm trying to teach these girls. Uh, think independently. Be curious. Be skeptical. Be skeptical of everything you hear, except for me, of course. <laughs> yeah. Be very, very skeptical. Uh, try to get as many sources of information as you can. I used to read news, but I still read, read, get information from various countries, various news sources uh, all the time, because I know if you hear what he says and she says and he says and they say, then you can put it all into your brain and you might get it right. But right. listening to one source of information is especially in 2017, is a dangerous thing to do. So with that, Mr. Rogers, thank I really, you. I really thank pleasure. you for your time. My pleasure. It's been a great pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I, I w I'm going to say China just because it's so exciting now what's happening in China. Uh, it's a country that, it's the only country in world history that's had recurring periods of greatness. Egypt was great once, Rome was great once, Spain was great once, uh, but China's been great three or four times in history. Uh, it's been the best, the, the top nation in the world, three or four, it's had total collapse three or four times, right. catastrophe, but it's the only country that after it hits bottom in a few decades or centuries, it turns around and rises to the top again. And it's happening now, so it's very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. There'll be problems in, in China as we go along. You know, in America, America became the most successful country in the 20th century. But along the way, we had 15 depressions with a D. We had a horrible civil war. We had massacres in the streets. We had very little rule of law. America was a mess many times. And yet, we became extremely sick. So China's going to have problems. Don't worry. There'll be plenty of problems. I don't know what or when or why, but I know they will. But China is on the rise again, and that's exciting to watch. Plus, of course, China has a long history, very lots of culture, lots of interesting things have happened, lots of art and architecture. So it's a very, very uh, interesting country as well as being an exciting period. Mm. I mean, India has a long and varied history too, but it's a mess. <laughs> so it's not as exciting now as right. China. What is your take on um, this theory that some people have that technology to some extent could offset the effect of this money printing. Like they're like all these central banks printing money, they're just hoping that technology will like make a huge jump and offset all that liquidity in the world somehow. Hope. Hope. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see it. I, I have learned in my life that I cannot base my life or my investments, especially on hope. Right. Uh, I have to be as factual as I possibly can because now I, I get it wrong. I make many mistakes, but uh, hope is not going to help you as an investor or with your life either. Uh, if you move to a country because you love it and you hope it's going to get better, yeah. chances are you're making a big mistake. Right. You have to, now, I, I don't know if some, there may be some great technological change which is going to save everything. I don't know what it is. Money is certainly, you know, the world has a huge problem with money right now, currency, finance, uh, because America's a big debtor. Much of Europe is hugely in debt. So we have a, a problem with money. Now, most problems, most things that, that we know are being changed by the computer. My children will never go to a bank when they're adults. They'll never go to a post office when they're adults. Uh, so the computer is changing everything. So it's certain that something on the computer technology is going to change money. I don't know what, but I know that some, something is going to happen that way. Uh, will that save us? No. No, you cannot just artificially create money and build up gigantic debt. At least you never have been able to in history. Right. Now, maybe it's different this time, but I know you're knowledgeable enough to know that it's very dangerous to say things are different 
this, this time. time. <laughs> They're right. never different this right. time, right. I assure you. Uh, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but there's no technological change that's going to save the basic problem. Too much debt. Money is being cheapened uh, and debased day after day. Right. It may not collapse next week, but certainly within the next few years, we're going to all pay the price. Yeah. Could it be that instead of one huge collapse, be something progressive? What is your take on that? Well, yeah, it, it certainly it is progressive, uh, but there will be collapses sure. along the way uh, mm -hmm. and rallies along the way. You know, in 1918, the UK was the richest, most, it was the, there was no second number two in 1918. Germany had been destroyed. There was no, America was rising, but in 1918, it was the UK. Well, it's been a long way down. Uh, the UK is not even in the top 25 anymore, and it's got gigantic debts. So it's been a long, slow, steady decline. But if you've right. been in the UK for the past 100 years, you might have had a wonderful time. You might have gotten very, very rich. Right. Most people, have, it, it has declined. It's been slow and steady. There have been big, sharp declines and rallies along the way. But, I mean, look at Spain, you know. We're never going to pay this debt, are we? <laughs> well, in 1517, 500 years ago, Spain was on top of the world. Mm. There's no question. But even by 1617, it wasn't bad. 1717 wasn't bad. 1817 gotten pretty bad in Spain, but it was a long, long, slow, steady decline as they debased the currency, they ran up debts, they made many mistakes. Uh, but along the way, you could have made a lot of money in Spain yeah. in those three or 400 years of decline. But if you go to Spain today, it's not 1517. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly <laughs> In not. In 1517, <laughs> they were on top of the world. They controlled the world. They were the single most successful country. Well, China probably, well, China by 1517 had started the climb. By, but this is not 1517 right. in Spain. How come the small entrepreneur that cannot, for example, somebody who has a small business, Spain, France, UK, one of those bankrupt countries, uh, how can this person protect himself against the upcoming turmoil? I mean, he doesn't have really uh, any leverage in the way of moving his finances. A small business can't really move to Asia. How can this person protect himself against this? It teaches children and grandchildren Mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first. He, that's the first thing that he uh, should do. He should make sure his children and grandchildren learn Mandarin. Uh, you say he cannot move. Well, if he oh, can't. doesn't want to. Or, uh, well, okay, he doesn't want to move. Right. But if in 1517, a Spanish had left Spain, he might have been better off for right. his grandchildren. Right. His great-grandchildren certainly would have been better off. Uh, likewise, in America, you know, uh, my forebears went to America 400 years ago. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm right. glad. Right. But, you know, uh, these days, I'm not sure that going to America is the place to be for the next 100 or 200 years. Uh, in my view, it's, it's Asia. But uh, to the answer to your question is I told you, teach your children and grandchildren Mandarin. Don't get too deep in debt because there is a big debt crisis coming uh, in the next uh, few years. So if you have a lot of debt, you're not going to have the flexibility to survive. That you're, Some of your neighbors are going to go broke. That will give you opportunities, if, unless you're going broke too. Right. But if you're still financially solvent and sound, you will be able to survive when others around you are not. Now, debt is wonderful if you handle it properly. But in a crisis, very few people can handle debt pr properly just because circumstances force them right. to lose control. How soon do you think the, the interest rates will start to rise? What's well, they've already on? started rising. Yeah, uh, the uh, short-term rates have already started going up. Uh, right now, I would suspect that will continue. Long-term rates may well go down again for a while just because so many people are pessimistic right. about uh, bonds these days, which means you're bound to have a rally. But over the next few years, interest rates are going to continue to go higher and higher. And they, it's going to get out of control. Yeah, how high do you think they could go? <sighs> hey, Jesus, if you had if to I, get, if I, I told you, if I, I told, I, I can tell you. <laughs> but if I told you, you wouldn't listen anymore. You'd hang up and go home. Uh, so no, tell me. 
<laughs> well, what is, what uh, is your, your guess or your take? Interest rates have been going down for 35 years in the United States, long term, well, long and short term rates, been going down for 35 years. And then before that, they'd been going up for 35 years. They actually hit bottom in 1946, and they went up for the next uh, 35 years. Not that there's anything magic about 35 right. years, but you're going to see interest rates go much, much higher. They'll probably go back to their all-time highs, which in America is 15 or 20 percent, uh, not, not anytime soon. But over the next uh, decade or two, you're going to see interest rates in America. I mean, the U.S. dollar is going to go down a lot. I own a lot of dollars. It's going to go higher. It's a question of timing. Much right? higher first. Right. But uh, you're going to see, and in fact, when interest rates go higher, it's going to help the U.S. dollar, I hope, because I own a lot. But in the beginning, it'll be wonderful for the dollar as interest rates go higher. But then when people realize that America is the largest debtor nation in the world, there is no control. There is, it's going to continue to get worse. You're going to have Spain, Britain, many other countries that cannot and will not pay their debts. You're going to see more currency turmoil, which would be good for the dollar for a while. But interest rates will go higher and higher because people are just going to say, listen, I don't want this paper. I don't want this garbage anymore. If I'm going to take your garbage paper, you got to pay me very high interest rates in order to get me to do that. So interest right. rates in the U.S. and therefore the world will go much, much higher. Right. In 30 years, you'll see. It's going to be very, very, very high again, right. just like in 1981. Are they gold? What is your take on that? Well, I, I own some gold. I haven't bought gold in a serious way for uh, quite some time. I've hedged uh, my gold. In fact, r not all of it, but some of it right now. Uh, I expect the dollar is going to go higher, as we've explained. And often when the dollar goes higher, gold goes down. It doesn't have to. It doesn't always happen. But that will probably happen for a while. So the dollar goes higher. I'm going to sell my dollars. It's going to turn into a bubble. I sell my dollars. Well, gold will be down. And I'll buy gold. Hey, you see how easy it is to get rich? <laughs> you <laughs> see? Listen. It's so easy. <laughs> Sitting here on this sofa, <laughs> I just got very, very rich. Uh, so right. That's what I, who knows what's going to happen. But right. that's my view. And when that happens... Chances are I'll put my uh, money into gold. But, you know, there are a lot of governments right now that are starting to attack gold again. The Indians, who are the, huge, the, the largest owners of gold, right. that guy's doing his best to destroy gold again. So who knows? It may be the renminbi when the dollar goes higher. Maybe by then the renminbi will be convertible. I, I don't know.